Recall last fall, just before the election, there was a big announcement that the FBI had foiled an extensive, detailed extremist plot to kidnap Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer and overthrow that state's government. And it wasn't just a moment for the FBI to pound their chests about just how much they protect you from terrorism. But of course, it was also a political opportunity for Whitmer and Democrats to take a timely shot at Trump as well. Whitmer said in a speech at the time that hate groups hear Trump's words as a rallying cry and a call to action. Trump's hate speech was complicit in what could have been a fatal attack against her, she said. Now that talking point was bunk even at the time, even taken at face value. There was no evidence to say that the alleged plotters were pro-Trump. There was, however, evidence to say that they were anti-Trump, that they hated Trump just as much as they hated Whitmer, and that evidence was available and known at the time of Whitmer's speech. But of course, the point isn't the facts. The point is the politics. The point is browbeating the opposition. They don't care about protecting you from threats. They care about protecting and advancing their own political interests. And until now, you might have believed that threat was real, even if it was twisted for political effect. We were supposed to believe that a bunch of guys in Hawaiian shirts got way too into their memes and there wasn't enough pushback among them until their jokes became an actual plot to kidnap a governor in action. And it just so happens that our professional guardians at the FBI had a watchful eye on the whole thing and thwarted it just in the nick of time. But like all politically maximized stories, there's the initial headline level breaking news presentation, and then there's the actual story that comes trickling out fact by fact months later to much lower attention. Until now, all the guys arrested in this alleged plot have just been silent political punching bags, all-purpose mud with which to smear the opposition. And that's not to say that none of them did anything wrong or there's no basis to charge any of them with crimes. There may very well be, but it is to say that now that they're having their days in court, there's a lot more information getting revealed that shows who the alleged conspirators really are in this case is a highly debatable question. And it's not debatable to say that this plot was organized, developed, and enacted, at least in part, by the FBI themselves. It is not debatable to say that the FBI wanted this plot to continue and to happen. It is not debatable to say that the FBI paid informants, not just undercover agents, but civilians that they hired and installed as plants to ensure the plot would continue and happen even if the targets of the investigation were actively opposing the plot. The debate is not whether the FBI organized this plot. The debate is to what degree, and whether that degree is high enough to call the whole thing a setup or entrapment. That's what the evidence emerging in court suggests, and it's what these trials will decide. There's a long and I can't believe I'm saying it, but I am. Excellent piece in BuzzFeed this week that reveals new evidence and an entire timeline of the plot's development as constructed from court documents and dozens of interviews. If you're interested in the details of this case, it is well worth your time to sit down and read it. But for video purposes, I'll break it down to a more condensed version. The Wolverine Watchmen, the group charged with organizing this plot, originally called themselves a patriot group. Some might call them a militia group, but based on the available evidence, they were mostly just a meme team. They were a Facebook group of guys who shared constitutional values, and yes, they also shared spicy memes against government tyranny during the spring lockdowns of last year. The group had formed just prior in November of 2019, and there were three original members. To keep things simple, since there are a lot of names to remember, we'll just call them Founders A, B, and C. In March of 2020, a guy named Dan enters the story. Dan is an Iraq war veteran, and Dan is looking for exactly this sort of meme team. Or more specifically, he's looking for a group of like-minded guys who are as passionate about gun rights as he is. So he's scrolling through Facebook, and he finds this group, the Wolverine Watchmen. And after some brief vetting, Dan joins, and he participates in the group's communication channels. But within a few weeks, Dan sees some messaging he believes to be a threat against police officers. We can't see the original messaging, so we have to rely on Dan's characterization. But Dan believes the threat to be credible. So he contacts his local police and he shows them the messages. And he thinks he's done with the group and he's moving on. Until Dan then gets a text from an FBI agent who says, Hey Dan, how'd you like to spy for us? Here, 
try on this wire. And supposedly there was no talk of compensation at this time, but the FBI did pay Dan pretty handsomely for his services over time. So Dan is now an FBI spy. And the next month in April, he attends that protest at the Michigan Capitol with the Wolverine Watchmen. This is the one that had all those widely publicized photos of armed protesters inside the building. And the Wolverine Watchmen themselves were in what may have been the most famous photo of the day, though it should be noted there was no violence that day, or at least violence against government officials. There was one arrest for a fight between two individuals, but the Watchmen were not involved. The Watchmen exercised their constitutional rights that day, they were not arrested, they were not charged with any crimes. But while that Capitol protest was uneventful, at least in criminal implications at the time, it was a turning point for the Watchmen and the FBI's involvement within the group. A guy named Adam Fox was also in attendance at the Capitol that day, and apparently he's a little more willing to commit violent action, as we'll see, though he is not a member of the Wolverine Watchmen at the time. And the viral photo of the Watchmen also brings them attention of so-called militia groups elsewhere and nationally. The next month in May, the Watchmen are invited repeatedly. They are strongly recruited to attend a national militia meeting in Ohio, despite the encouragement. No Watchmen attend this Ohio meeting, but of course, Dan the Fed does on their behalf, as does Adam Fox, the Hawaiian shirt enthusiast who was also at the Michigan Capitol. And who organized this national militia meeting? A man nicknamed Roby, who is, of course, a prior federal informant. Now, we don't know for sure that he was working on behalf of the FBI in this case, but he has many times in the past, and he's now caught up in a separate legal issue saying he was working with the FBI at the time, so you can draw your own conclusion on that. So just to be clear, despite the encouragement, none of the original Watchmen go to this likely FBI-organized event in Ohio, but Dan the FBI plant does, and Adam Fox, the more hardened but as of yet uninvolved Boogaloo boy, is also there. So Dan then works with the FBI to bring Adam Fox into the Watchmen. Dan goes to his FBI handlers and makes a phone call to Adam Fox at FBI direction and recruits him into the group. Dan invites Adam Fox over to Founder B's house for tactical training, which, by the way, Dan the Federal Plant has been running for this group the whole time for weeks now, and according to the story, Tactical training isn't really what the group was interested in prior to Dan the Fed's involvement. They wanted to focus on other things, but anyway, Dan successfully recruits Fox into the group and then asks him what his big plans are. It is then that Fox brings up hog-tying the governor and taking hostages. Wow, it sure seems like Dan the FBI plant is doing a hell of a lot of organizational work, doesn't it? He's baiting the group to attend likely FBI-organized events. He's recruiting new, more extreme membership. He's coaxing detailed criminal plans out of that new membership. It sounds like a lot of work, because it is a lot of work. And in just two months' time, Dan has gone from curious newbie to second in command of the group. And now that he's pulling in guys with more extreme ideas, the original members are starting to push back. Members vocally oppose Adam Fox's plans, saying they aren't down with offensive kidnapping. The original leaders of the group are opposed to Fox's plans as well, and his membership generally. But Dan the Plant, at the FBI's guidance, uses his influence to convince others to keep Adam Fox around. And in order to win and maintain favor under his developing leadership, Dan has to keep the perks flowing. So he convinces his guys to attend another out-of-state meeting in Wisconsin with that same likely federal informant, Roby. And they all had dinner to discuss, quote, kicking off the boog, and they did tactical training organized by Dan the Fed and Roby the likely federal informant. And of course, Dan the Fed made it an all-expenses-paid trip. He rented the car to get them there, he paid for the gas, he paid for the food, he paid for the hotel, and of course, it's not actually his bank account, it's the FBI's. But despite Dan the Fed's generosity, group membership still isn't comfortable with all of this talk of offensive crime, and so founders B and C just leave the group entirely. They quit. The two cited debt and marital problems, but given the timing, one would infer the group's increasing federally guided extremism was a likely factor in their decision making. So Dan the Fed is now running the whole show after showing up just a few months prior. So it's late July and the group is now run by a federal plant 
and a more extreme outsider, the federal plant himself recruited against the judgment of the original group, which means we can finally get down to some actual plotting. And for that, of course, we're gonna need even more feds. Dan the Fed keeps pushing Adam Fox to get more serious, encouraging him to write a manifesto and a specific plot. And as the group gets more extreme, more original members quit. And newly revealed text messages show the FBI working with Dan to recruit as many new members as possible. The more the merrier, the FBI agent says. Big recruitment means a good day. So Dan the Fed is having a lot of trouble maintaining the group's actual membership, but he's doing a great job of supplementing it with new federal membership. Dan and the group start scouting out Whitmer's property in September and decide they want to blow up a bridge in the process of this kidnapping plot. But to do that, they're gonna need an explosives expert. And that's not very easy to find, but luckily Dan the Fed has two Fed friends to assist with that, two undercover agents, one posing as an explosives expert and salesman. So this Fed explosive salesman agrees to sell the group $4,000 worth of C4 to blow up the bridge. And wow, he even agrees to toss in some medical kits and plate carriers too, free of charge. What a nice guy. And after months of this federally guided and assisted plotting, finally, in early October, the group is arrested on their way to go pick up those explosives from that Fed salesman with Dan the other Fed driving them there, of course. And just how serious was the group about making this purchase? The agreed upon price was $4,000. The group only brought a few hundred bucks with them. But regardless, group members were arrested at the scene. Other members who had quit before this plot had ever seriously started were still rounded up and charged. And Dan the Fed was paid a total of nearly $55,000 for seven months of work, including reimbursement for expenses. That's considerably more than most families in that part of Michigan earn in a year. And that's a lot of information to process, but just to summarize, the big terrorist plot that you heard so much about last fall was organized chiefly by an FBI plant and a guy that FBI plant recruited specifically for that purpose. And the arrests were made pursuant to a deal made with another FBI plant. So there is no part of this story that isn't thoroughly smudged with FBI fingerprints. And because of that fact, some of the defendants are now focused on an entrapment defense. The idea that the FBI baited them into committing a crime. And I'm not a lawyer. I'm not keen on entrapment specifics, but the crux of that case will generally be whether the group members had a predisposition to commit these crimes. Law enforcement can legally tempt you and if you're still totally willing to commit the crime, you can still be prosecuted and convicted. Now what predisposition means and what the evidence shows, those are legal questions that the trials will answer. And I don't have enough evidence or legal expertise to answer them myself, but here are the basic layman questions that matter in understanding what happened in this case. Did the Wolverine Watchmen have existing plans to kidnap Gretchen Whitmer before the FBI's involvement? No. Did the group have existing plans to illegally acquire explosives before the FBI's involvement? No. Was any of the group's original leadership present at the explosive buy that triggered the arrests? No. The FBI was not a passive fly on the wall just monitoring a plot in development. They were active organizers of the entire plan from its inception. As BuzzFeed's report summarizes, the extent of the FBI involvement raises questions as to whether there would have even been a conspiracy without them. And just in case you still think that this sort of ethical bending would be beneath our great men and women of law enforcement and the justice system, note that one of the lead FBI agents on the case was charged on Monday with beating his wife after an argument at a swingers party allegedly slamming her head against a nightstand repeatedly. I guess he was mad about who she banged or who she didn't bang, and so he banged her face into some sharp corners. Whatever happened, it's a weird look for a supposed agent of truth and justice. And did you know that one of the lead prosecutors in the Michigan State cases related to this plot, he was reassigned in May pending an attorney general's investigation into whether he withheld evidence about deals cut with informants during a 2000 murder case. Infer what you will if those questionable ethics may have transferred to this case here. And there may be even more complications. The BuzzFeed piece characterizes this Michigan plot as a precursor to the January 6th Capitol riot. 
intending to compare the two events as extremist right-wing terrorist attacks, but the similarities aren't just in the crimes allegedly committed. The similarities are also who's investigating them. And in fact, it is the exact same FBI agent who led both investigations. As reported by Revolver last month, this agent went from the Detroit FBI field office where he oversaw this Whitmer plot investigation and afterward was immediately promoted to the DC office to oversee the January 6th cases. You know, just like the FBI sniper guy who shot Randy Weaver's wife at Ruby Ridge and got a pat on the back and a ticket straight to Waco for a job well done. In the FBI, at least in select cases, you don't just fail upward, you abuse upward. If you want to be harsher, you murder upward. You terroristically plot upward, at least debatably. So we'll see what more we learn in court. For now, if your neighbor persistently invites you to a Hawaiian-themed dinner with a free armor giveaway, you don't just politely decline. You tell them to get the hell off your lawn. But the way things are going, they'll probably still find a way to get you just for talking to him anyway. Thanks as always for listening and for supporting this channel always. Appreciate that thoughtful discussion down below and especially over on Parlor that is at ML Christensen. You're always welcome to coming out and chat in my live streams. Those are linked down in the description. Luke King, forward to it. Goodbye.